everybody. Welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here. And I have to start off the show with a little bit of an apology. A lot of you have been sending me DM questions or questions at purpleinsider.com. And I haven't gotten around to making a fans only episode recently. So here you are. Uh, if you can't participate in the YouTube chats and so forth, I still want to make sure that we get everybody's questions in. So that the best way to contribute to a fans only episode, go to purpleinsider.com or go to my Twitter at Matthew Collar. Just send me a direct message and I will get it there and make sure I do my best to answer your questions on one of these episodes. And with a long off season ahead of us, we're going to have a lot to talk about as we go forward. So anything and everything for you is on the table. So let's dive right in to the questions that I've been a little slow in answering, but we'll get to them now. And I appreciate everybody who took the time to send them. So here we go. From Ryan, does Daniil Hunter fit the Vikings time horizon? And when will we know? We're going to very likely know, similar to Kirk Cousins, at the start of free agency because we haven't talked about it very much as it pertains to Daniil Hunter, but he actually carries a dead cap hit if the Vikings move on from him as well. The minute he hits free agency, I believe it's $14 million in dead cap hit hit the Vikings. So it's very unlikely that they would take a $14 million dead cap hit and then still circle back and sign Daniil Hunter. So it really comes down to getting an extension done before the start of free agency. So that's kind of when we'll know is that week leading up to free agency. If they get an extension done, then, then he's coming back. Obviously, if they do not, then it is extremely unlikely that he would return. As far as whether he fits the time horizon, it's a difficult question because Daniil Hunter is 30 years old, which is old, but not ancient for an edge rusher. We've seen many edge rushers in the past go well past the age of 30 and still be very good contributors to their team. I think what, how old was Vaughn Miller when he helped the Los Angeles Rams win the Super Bowl, but also Vaughn Miller, a cautionary tale that when he fell off, he fell off extremely hard. And that's been the case for most rushers where they'll have a really good season. And then all of a sudden it's kind of over and they don't have the same juice as they did before. And we are talking about somebody with an injury history that might concern the Vikings as far as signing him to a long-term extension. But I think Daniil Hunter kind of fits everything all the time. He fits every team. He fits every situation. He fits every scheme. He played really well with Ed Donatelle. He played even better with Brian Flores. He played great under Mike Zimmer. It, it doesn't seem to really matter what you do with Daniil Hunter. He's going to succeed. And if you look at the way the man is built and how he takes care of his body and also how he gets his sacks, it's not necessarily the quick twitch muscles where he's flying by somebody on the edge. Usually he's overpowering them or he's beating them in some sort of technical way with hand fighting or whatever spin move uh, that he has concocted. So he kind of strikes me as a player who could continue to have success through a dip or a rebuild type of season and then come back on the other side. I think the question would be for Daniil Hunter do you want to be the entire pass rush again? Because unless the Vikings can spend a lot of money and sign other pass rushers, then he's going to have to carry a very heavy load. And Hunter might also want to go to a team that's going to be favored to win the Super Bowl because he's going to have all sorts of interest if he hits free agency. And this team has continued to kick the can down the road over and over and over with Daniil Hunter as it pertains to his contract. They've never seemed to want to go all in. And at some point, if you're Daniil, you've got to say, well, I'd like to some uh, be with somebody who isn't just dating and wants to actually get married because the Vikings have been on year to year with him. And I think we finally saw some of that frustration from Hunter last year when he held out a couple of days at training camp before reworking his deal. And there were reports even up to the last minute that the Vikings were still very strongly considering trading Daniil Hunter. So I think from his perspective, he might just want to hit the free agency market. He might want to go try to chase a championship with a team that's looking for one more edge rusher. But as far as whether he fits the timeline, I think he still does 
because if we're projecting him forward and we don't know as much about his medical situation as the Vikings, but if we're projecting him forward, he doesn't strike me as one of those players that will just lose quickness and fall off the face of the earth. He looks like a guy who's going to have an extended period of being a great rusher. But at the same time, when a guy has 16 and a half sacks before he's ready to hit free agency, the price is extremely, extremely high. I still think that they could do this, especially if Kirk Cousins did not come back and they could give him a, a, a very good paycheck. And even if he had a high cap hit, we talk about this with Jefferson sometimes. It's okay if you have some expensive stars on your team. Everybody doesn't have to be wildly cheap. I mean, go look at the 49ers and the Chiefs. They have a handful of players who are very expensive. You just can't have a million of those guys and an expensive quarterback. Um, but if the Vikings were paying Hunter, Derrissaw, Jefferson, that's not that's not too many. As long as they could uh, build around those guys in some sort of crafty way with good free agent signings and drafting. Um, but if they were to move on from him, they have so much to replace there, but they would also have the cap space that he leaves behind more so in 2025 to be able to do it. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's very much on the edge and I think that they will have an offer for him, but the way things have worked in the Quasi Adafo Mensa, Kevin O'Connell era is that they seem to put a price on a player. And if that, that player does not agree to the price, they're usually not going to come down. They're going to stay where they're at. So it will be on Daniil Hunter to decide, can he get more elsewhere or is he going to stay with the Vikings? Uh, I know that this man obviously cares a great deal about the Vikings, really loves being here, but there's at some point where the market is so much higher than what you're getting offered that you have to go out and see. So I, yeah, I, I think that they could make it work with him, but I right now would lean toward him not coming back. I guess we'll have to see how that works out. But if they sign him, I won't say, oh my gosh, this win now move, what are they doing? Because the projection for where this thing is going is you're supposed to compete, really truly compete and build a stacked roster by 2025. And I think he would still be good until then. All right, next question comes from John. Do we just have to believe in the process of Kwesi Adafo Mensa and Kevin O'Connell or are we going to be a middling team for the next couple of seasons? I mean, that is the fundamental question that is on everybody's mind, John. I think everyone is thinking this. Are you going to do something that uh, looks like where you were headed from the beginning, which is to take apart the roster, fix the salary cap? You hope to gather draft picks, but they spent some on TJ Hawkinson. Uh, but try to rebuild through the draft and through young players and through cap space around a rookie quarterback contract. Everything that they did leading up to this point says that that was the plan. When they arrived here, they gave Kirk Cousins the shortest extension that they possibly could. And then after he had a great season in 2022, the Netflix audience loved him. He had comeback win after comeback win. He and Kevin O'Connell seemed to be on the same page. And Kirk Cousins had more joy and more fun and endeared himself more to the fans than he ever did before under Mike Zimmer. And they didn't give him a contract extension because they had a number. And when Kirk Cousins would not agree to that number, they did not move. And it might be very well the same situation here where they are going to put a number on what could we bring you back for and still spend money around you to try to be competitive. And if he doesn't agree to that number, then he's going to hit free agency and that will complete the plan, the competitive rebuild plan with a draft pick uh, in April. And so if that's what ultimately happens, then I would believe in that process as being the best possible version of a competitive rebuild. Would you have liked to hit on a couple more draft picks? Of course, from the 2022 draft. And you know maybe that's one of the things that makes it a little bit harder is when you've got so many holes on your roster, there's probably an inclination to say, gosh, we really need that quarterback back because without him, our roster's not going to be able to take us somewhere. But we've seen that story play out a bunch of times. If you have just enough good players to form a starting lineup that's competitive, you probably don't have enough players to play 17 games and then multiple playoff games. And we witnessed what a couple of injuries on defense did to this team. 
they need a longer term over a couple years build around a cheaper quarterback contract and maybe somebody that is a little more gifted in the art of escapability. I was watching uh, today on Twitter some highlights of Fran Tarkenton, and I thought, you know, scrambling quarterbacks are the rage, but it still worked way back then, didn't it? Uh, so, you know, I, I think that if they complete that from start to, I don't want to say finish, but from start to the point of moving on from Kirk Cousins, then I would give them a major thumbs up and say you did exactly what you said you were going to do. Now, I think, of course, that going into 2022, they could have started this process faster or earlier. Doesn't necessarily mean tank, but meaning moving on from the old, bringing in the new. I don't think that Delvin Cook or Adam Thielen or Eric Kendricks performed in 2022 like they did when they were in their primes. And if they had moved on, they could have started finding replacements for those guys then. But they didn't. That wasn't the plan that ownership hatched from the time that they were hired. They wanted to run it back, and they won 13 games in doing so. And if the timeline ends up working out like you won 13 games, then you won seven and drafted your quarterback, then you had a rookie quarterback season where you were competitive or whatever happens, and in 2025, you have the expectation of being a serious contender, then I would have to say, like, trust that, believe in that. That was the right way to go. Who knows if it's going to work out because we've gone through this a million times with a rookie quarterback, but if you hit on that guy, then you have a great chance to build that complete roster that we've been talking about and talking about since the 2017 team disbanded going into 2020. But if they bring back Cousins, then it's a lot harder to believe in what you called the process because what is the process? I thought I understood it. I thought I understood it from everything Kwesi Adafo Mensa has said since he got here, where he's laid it out in numerous press conferences and probably will do so again at the combine. Well, I'll be there, by the way, and very, very interested to hear the tone of the brass at the combine as it pertains to where they stand with Cousins and the draft and all that sort of stuff. But if they bring him back, then it will look like they just took a different road, that they panicked that they deviated at the wrong time right when you had a chance with a draft that has multiple quarterbacks uh, expected to go in the first round. So the trust factor, it really depends on this huge decision that is about to happen right now. And if they do bring back Cousins, then it's I'm going to have to see it. I won't be convinced by words. I won't be convinced by signings. I will only be convinced as we actually see the team on the field succeeding, winning the division, going deep in the playoffs, that that was the right move because we've seen it so many times. Um, so the process will be very puzzling and confusing if they do end up bringing back Kirk Cousins. Connor says, KOC signed a four-year deal that would be up for a renegotiation after next year. Although You could do it now if they wanted to. Uh, how much do you think that him wanting Kirk back is to win eight or nine games to keep ownership happy. Well, let me let me put it this way about Kevin O'Connell and Quasi Dafomenza. One thing that they have going for them is their culture. And that is a brutal cliche in the NFL. Everybody talks culture all the time. And it's sort of this nebulous thing that all coaches come in and say, we're changing the culture here. We've got to have a great culture. But when we pick it apart and we say, what is this really? There's a lot of tangible things, including the way the team continued to play. Think about the losses that they had toward the end of the season. Think about the last game of the season. They could have had the doors blown off them when they went to Detroit, but they had the ball with a chance to, I believe, tie the game. Yeah, tie the game late when Nick Mullins threw an interception. Look at the way that they play. Look at the way Justin Jefferson played in that game. He didn't have to play in that game. Justin Jefferson could have said, I'm not playing in this game because if I get hurt, forget this. And he went and balled out and they had a good, a very competitive football game at the end. They battled. They barely lost to Cincinnati. They barely lost to Detroit. And I never got the sense from being in the locker room every day that there was cracks in the foundation, that players were questioning the coaches and the management. And there was guys headbutting. I never got that sense. We didn't hear any sort of little jabs and everything else. And, and trust me, after you've done this for a while, you've got pretty good radar 
uh, when you're hearing those things. And it didn't feel at all like this team was coming apart. In fact, they, they believed in themselves, I think, all the way through until they were officially eliminated. And that ties back into the coach. And it appears, and it's harder to say with the front office, but it appears that the operation in general is more inclusive toward having everybody involved in decision making and all those things that they were trying to sell from the very start. So the last question was about process. If you are the ownership and you're looking at the operation and the health of the operation, do the players buy into the coach? Can he keep them all pulling in the right direction? Can the general manager have everybody doing their job in the front office and contributing to the decision making and then ultimately trying to go in the best way possible at every single decision, every position, every free agent, every draft, whatever it is. And look, is that is that sort of a kumbaya utopia sort of thing? Yeah, a little bit. And ultimately, Kwesi Adapo Mensa is responsible for what happens. But just from a how is this running? It, did it hit a rough spot when you lost Kirk Cousins? Of course it did. It was bound to. But that shouldn't put anybody on a hot seat. And if they are executing their competitive rebuild plan the way that it was laid out and the players are still buying in and you are playing competitive football, then I don't see a reason for ownership to look at this thing and say, oh, they had a six win season with a rookie quarterback. You're all fired. I mean, I think about Buffalo and Sean McDermott a lot and what they did with getting Josh Allen. And the fact is they made the playoffs, then drafted Josh Allen, and then had a very tough year. Remember, they came to U.S. Bank Stadium and won in 2018 after they'd had the doors blown off them in the first couple of weeks. They kind of looked like a mess, and Josh Allen didn't have the best first year, but he showed a lot of signs. They made progress. They fought through it. They built around him. And they got through a down year without putting somebody as a head coach on the hot seat. And I think if you look historically, there are lots of coaches who have gone through downturns who were very competent coaches and had to bounce back uh, by rebuilding their roster because there's only so much that a coach can do uh, w when you don't have the horses to actually compete. And they have to keep that in mind. And maybe the best example is probably Marvin Lewis getting multiple chances to rebuild the Cincinnati Bengals and was successful in doing so. He made them a contender with Carson Palmer before he got hurt. That's going back a ways, but then did it again after some down seasons around Andy Dalton when they could draft and they could put together some really good players. So if, if everything is functional, you should be patient. You should give it time. We shouldn't always be existing in this world of, oh, they had a down season, fired, now my feeling on that is different if you push all the chips into the middle of the table with Kirk Cousins. Then you are making a bet, which everyone is responsible for, from the general manager to the coach to the ownership. They're all responsible if they make a bet on Kirk Cousins. Then if you win eight games, then you all should be let go because clearly you couldn't sell ownership on the right direction or you didn't make the right direction or you didn't do enough coaching-wise, general manager-wise, whatever it is, to make the owner's direction work around Kirk Cousins. So I'm kind of of different minds on this, but I think that if Kevin O'Connell is terrified of being fired and that's why he wants Kirk Cousins back, I would direct him to the 2021 season and ask, what happened? What happened there? The last person got fired <laughs> in your position when they failed to make the playoffs at eight, and nine with this quarterback. Are you sure that you want to take that risk? Uh, another thing is to this four-year contract thing is brought up pretty often. I don't care about it because in the NFL, everything is year to year. This whole warm, fuzzy feeling around the culture it could change really fast. A lot of times, the culture of an organization is only as good as its leadership in the locker room. And in recent years, the Vikings have had actually really good leadership in the locker room. Uh, I, you know, I think that Justin Jefferson practicing every day in training camp, things like that. I think Kirk Cousins over the last two years really took on a totally different role within that locker room as being a leader. Brian O'Neill, go back. They had Patrick Peterson, Eric Kendricks. A lot of great people were leading in that locker room. But if you lose some or you bring in some that don't fit very well, uh, things can be a little more dodgy. And I think about 2017 had an incredible locker room. 2018 did not. So sometimes it's hard to maintain and live and die on that culture 
But as long as the operation is moving along the way that it was supposed to go, there's no reason to look at this group and say, oh, you had a down year. Let's just get rid of you. Um, that's not the type of ownership that I think the Wilfs have ever really been. In fact, they were more patient with Mike Zimmer than they should have been by about you know two seasons more patient uh, than they really needed to be. Um, so I think that they'll have the same feeling for Kwesi Adolfo Mensa and Kevin O'Connell, but a lot of that depends on what happens next. Uh, this one comes from Nathan. Do you think Washington going with a defensive head coach affects their odds of trading out of the number two pick? I think that you, Nathan, really want that to be the case. <laughs> uh, do I think that that's the case? No, I don't. Uh, I think that one of the most attractive parts of that job is that you get to pick Drake May or Caleb Williams or Jaden Daniels, and you get to build your franchise around that player. I mean, if I'm looking for jobs to take, and I'm ranking jobs to take. Now, Washington is suddenly a good job to take, despite all the years of being a terrible job that no one should want. Also, in part, because their owner comes from the NBA, I think they're going to have a much more long view of how to build a team that's a championship contender. I mean, they are the process 76ers, and this is their owner. So this is the same guy who would be willing to take time and rebuild a team. If I'm a head coach, I am very happy to go to a place where I'm going to get a top quarterback out of the draft and then have time to build around him. Um, but I don't see any world where they just stick with Sam Howell. I mean, if they were to draft a wide receiver, an offensive tackle, and I don't know that there's any edge rusher that's ranked that high, but they did this once before and it cost them Tua or Justin Herbert, where they decided that it was more important to get Chase Young and stick with their current quarterback situation than it was to pick super high at the quarterback position. And man, if they had picked Justin Herbert, then Ron Rivera might still be coaching there. I think that was that him. Yeah, he was still coaching there when that happened, right? So it, that would have been a totally different world. And somebody said on Twitter, maybe it was Mitch Swartz, who uh, was the former offensive lineman. Uh, somebody was talking about how many coaches who got fired this year would not have been fired if Patrick Mahomes was their quarterback. And the answer is probably Josh McDaniels still finds a way to get fired because he can't be a head coach in the league, but everybody else still has a job and probably went deep in the playoffs. And you know who knows that? Dan Quinn. Because when he went to the Super Bowl, his quarterback played like an MVP. Everybody in the world knows it. If you get that guy, you have job security and you get to be known as a genius in the NFL for a long, long time. Um, so I don't think that it helps that the team, in my mind, the team you have to look at is New England. Would New England be willing to say our roster is so far away that we need to think a couple of years out? Or would they be on the opposite and think we need to get Kirk Cousins and offer him whatever he wants because we need to compete because Robert Kraft wants to win, does not want to lose, or we need to sign Baker Mayfield or something and trade out of that pick and get multiple picks and multiple wide receivers or offensive linemen to put around Baker Mayfield or Kirk Cousins. They have not been brought up at all as a Cousins location. I totally understand why. I don't think he's a Boston type of guy. I think he's much more of a Midwest type of guy that might not want to be in a market that's that insane. But I mean, I think from their perspective, if they're looking at a Mayfield, looking at a Cousins saying, we'll spend whatever because we don't ever want to have a season like that again, then you might be talking about them potentially trading out. I still have a difficult time seeing that, especially going from number 11 to number three. And we don't have to relive how Dobbs mania cost the Vikings their playoff or their uh, draft position. But it's not easy to go from that position all the way up. So what they have to bank on is maybe four or five being the spot where you could go up if Daniels drops past the top two. We don't know for sure that the NFL is as high on Jaden Daniels as we are. I mean, think about Justin Fields was projected as a top two, three quarterback. Uh, we've talked about the Will Levis thing at length, but also even Mac Jones was discussed as being that the pick that the 49ers traded up for, and they ultimately did not. It's not 100% totally locked in 
that everyone looks at Jaden Daniels and says, we want that as our franchise quarterback. And I, I just use the example of Washington passing up on Tua and Justin Herbert. So you never know. It's hard to figure out. But I don't know if a defensive head coach changes that, especially a guy who had gone to the Super Bowl on the back largely of his amazing quarterback. Uh, Sarah says, do you think that the reason I keep seeing our general manager saying they want Kirk back is that he doesn't think he'll be able to trade up in the draft? So this one connects with the last one. Well, uh, I think that the reason you would say you want Kirk Cousins back is because the opposite sounds terrible. Like if you were to say, if you're Kwesi Dafomensa and someone asks you in an interview, hey, Kwesi, uh, do you guys want Kirk back? And he said, look, man, I've been looking to get out from under this guy for years. Let me tell you, first thing I wanted to do when I got here was cut him, but they wouldn't let me. That would be a bad look. In fact, one of the first comments that he had as GM, unfortunately for him, in that USA Today piece was talking about how Kirk Cousins is just good and not great which I'm sure went over super well and was a great first impression for everybody. So he's really trying to avoid stepping on toes. He's trying to avoid insulting a quarterback that has the respect of the ownership, the locker room, the head coach, and uh, whose reputation over the last two years since this group came in has been one of a guy who's been very clutch and has played the position extremely well. Uh, it's something that you don't hear me say much on the show because ultimately check down on fourth and eight at the end of the game. But Kirk Cousins played really well in that playoff game against the New York Giants and probably deserved to win the game the way that he played. Uh, and so you can't look at that quarterback and the numbers he's put up, the way he's led them to wins, the toughness he's displayed and how he won over the locker room over the last two years and say, no, man, I can't wait to get rid of that guy. It really comes down to a matter of with this group, with Adolfo Mensa and O'Connell, just what we were talking about earlier, time horizon, timeline, where the organization stands and the risk that goes along with Cousins being an older quarterback. But you're not going to disrespect him if you're Quasi Adolfo Mensa. And the other thing is too, that you never know when your owner knocks on the door and says, you know what? I changed my mind. I was watching some Kirk Netflix and we decided we want him back. Make it happen. See you later you would be amazed how often that happens in the NFL. And then a team does something and everybody goes, huh, that's kind of wild. I don't get that. Well, sometimes that's an owner knocking on a door and making a move themselves and calling their shot. Uh, I remember there was a story way back when of uh, the Buffalo Bills owner who decided that he wanted the Bills to draft Willis McGahee despite the fact that Wills McGahee had torn apart his knee and no one was going to draft him in the first round, he decided we're drafting him in the first round because I like him. And then they did it. So sometimes, you know how we do all those things, the analysis, the breakdowns and everything else of positional value and all draft capital and everything else. Sometimes an owner can just say, here's what I want. And if you're Kwesi Adafo Mensa and you display any sort of disrespect toward Kirk Cousins. And then the ownership comes back and says, actually, we want him. That's going to be pretty uncomfortable, I would think. So there's no reason for him to say anything negative. It reminds me a little bit, possibly, we'll see how it plays out, reminds me a little bit of the Delvin Tomlinson situation. Last year at the Combine, Kwesi Dafomenso was asked about Delvin Tomlinson. And he gave a long answer about why they wanted him back. He made no bones about it. We want Delvin Tomlinson back. He said that they both have collections of shoes or something. And he would love to keep talking shoes with Delvin Tomlinson, whatever it was. I think it was shoes. And uh, yeah, they let him walk because the price was too high. So that's what we've gotten a lot of, even with you know somebody like Daniil Hunter, where it's a lot of compliments. We want them back, but at the end of the day, you know, players are very human and have feelings and that matters and the, the whole culture thing. But you brought in a guy with an economics background to understand the commodities that are players and to understand and put a finger on what they're exactly worth. So with Kirk Cousins, that's what it ultimately comes down to is if they, if they are thinking just for example, Two years, $70 million, that's, that's our number. And Kirk Cousins' agent goes to the combine 
And he has a couple of conversations with a couple of teams and they whisper two years, 85 million. Then if you're Kirk Cousins, the numbers there would represent that someone values you a lot more than your own team does. And it would result in him leaving. But if he says, hey, that's about as much as I think I can get. And I love it here. And I think we can win. Then he'll come back. And that That's I feel like that's what it comes down to unless they just totally sandbag him, which they might. I don't know. Unless they just say, yeah, for us, it's two years, 40. But that would be disrespectful, too. So I, I don't know. It's that negotiation. Uh, I would love to be part of it and then come back and tell you guys about it. But I'm not. So we'll have to see how uh, that plays out. But I think that's why he said so many complimentary things. As far as trading up, it will be difficult. And the one thing that just concerns me a bit is when I hear that they only want to draft a quarterback if it's going to be their quarterback for 10 years. I just don't think that that's necessary. And I think the Philadelphia Eagles are the greatest example of this. They draft Carson Wentz. He gives them immense value for a couple seasons. Even the seasons where they won nine games or so, he was playing well. Not as well as he did in his second season, but I think he had maybe back-to-back nine and seven seasons where he kind of grinded it out with that team as they they slipped as a roster post-2017. So he gave them really good value. He was a hit. He was a successful draft pick. Does that mean he was a 10-year quarterback? No. And when they decided he was too expensive, they drafted another guy and they put him in. Like That's kind of the way you have to manage this in my mind. But teams are always looking for perfect, but I don't think that perfect should be the enemy of good enough to compete for a Super Bowl if you get that guy and put everybody around him. So that that's how I feel about that. But they may be thinking that they only want their 10-year quarterback, but you might just wait and wait and wait, and uh, it never comes because that those opportunities just can pass you by. And the other thing is, too, I mean, there's all these stories about how The Chiefs were obsessed with Patrick Mahomes. They were going to do anything under the sun to get Patrick Mahomes and all that. But, you know, he still he still dropped past a bunch of teams like quarterback evaluation. Do you believe in yourself? If you look at Bo Nix at the senior bowl and go, I don't know. You also have to factor in that nobody really knows how that's going to work out once somebody gets there and the improvements that they have to make once they get into the league. Um, Anyway. Uh, This from Jerry says, I'd be curious about your thoughts on who the guy KOC would like. Who would he want? Which quarterback? Well, I mean, everybody would want the top two. There's nobody who would not want the top two when it comes to uh, Caleb Williams or Drake May. And with Jaden Daniels, I'd be very curious about that, uh, his opinion. But I mean, we're talking about somebody with special tools, like really, truly special tools who I think will need to develop as everyone does in the NFL and sharpen those tools. And it might be a little more joggy at times. Like there might be more mistakes than there is with someone like Lamar Jackson, for example, who's become a quarterback who protects the football and can throw from the pocket and can do just about anything that took years. Lamar was very young when he was drafted, which allowed for a big development track. You know, with Jaden Daniels, it might not be that way. Um, It it might have more miscues and misreads and things like that off the bat than you might have with someone like Bo Nix or Michael Penix. But the upside to that is somebody who could be an absolute force. I mean, let's just say like what you saw from Justin Fields in the second half of the season is probably Jaden Daniels floor. And that's still good enough to win a lot of football games with on the rookie contract, et cetera and with great wide receivers as well. That's the floor, I think, for Jaden Daniels. Um, But if you're talking about the guys who it's more realistic that they could draft, I could see an argument for all three quarterbacks. Uh, As far as Michael Penix goes, when you look at the windows that Kevin O'Connell is asking his quarterbacks to throw through a lot of times, look at the what I like to do is go back and watch the coaches film from the all 22 back angle, you can see a lot of times what the quarterback sees. And sometimes Kirk Cousins is throwing a ball with a ton of anticipation where the guy hasn't come out of his route yet. He's got to throw it before he makes the break and just trust he's going to be there. Well, Michael Penix is really good at that. And then sometimes you need your quarterback in the Super Bowl, like Matthew Stafford, 
to just wind up and let one rip a no look pass to Cooper Cup over the middle where it whizzes by a linebacker or something. Michael Penix can do that too. I think he's got really good poise, maturity. I think he understands football extremely well. All those things would gel with Kevin O'Connell really, really well. Now with Bo Nix, he's a little bit more tricky because he's not quite as big as Penix and his arm isn't quite as big, but he's very good at executing what he's asked to do, where if you draw it up, he should be able to make it work. He's not flawless, of course, and he's not six foot five, uh, but at the same time, I mean, accurate enough to get it to open wide receivers over and over again, did not take sacks didn't have a huge amount of mistakes. And even when you saw him at the senior bowl in a very small sample, he could get the ball downfield. If it's Justin Jefferson on his deep throw that got dropped, Jefferson is catching that ball and uh, going for 50 yards. So he showed that he could push it downfield. And he also is just very good at finding the underneath stuff open, which the Vikings, they like to push it down the field. But think of all those TJ Hawkinson plays where it just takes a good decision and being on the same page. I could see him liking that. And with J.J. McCarthy, tools, 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 right? It's all about he's got a big arm and he's a good athlete and he's supposedly a real smart kid. And so can you take that and mold that over a year on the bench or something or on the fly to make him into a really good quarterback? I would tend to lean toward my first impression was that Michael Penix was the best fit. I think I'm going to stick with that, that he is the best fit. I've kind of moved back and forth with some of the draft analysts. Like, hey, if they think Bo Nix is a better prospect and he's going higher, then okay, then let's talk ourselves into that. Uh, I haven't seen too much McCarthy going over those two recently, but if they do it, okay, let's let's see it then. Uh, if they let the number 11 pick go to a defensive tackle and then they trade back up, then all right, let's do that then. I mean, I think there's a lot of different ways they could go with these three players that would make it a good fit with O'Connell. Really, all three of them, there's not, none of the three would I say, oh, terrible fit, terrible, terrible fit. I think Jaden Daniels is actually the hardest fit to see because we haven't seen, aside from Josh Dobbs for two weeks, a true scrambling quarterback. And there is a lot going on in, in O'Connell's offense. But Penix is probably the best fit. And then Knicks and then McCarthy. That's how I've got it right now. Very much subject to change. And they probably won't tell us or anybody else would be my guess. Because, hey, remember last year, we went down to the final minutes not knowing for sure whether they actually would pick Will Levis or not. And they ultimately didn't like him. Uh, a couple more questions here from Corey. Uh, if um, I think you mean, does sitting a year increase success uh, for a quarterback? Seems like the quarterbacks who sat more often were uh, successful. Yeah, or, yeah, okay. Sat more often than not were successful starters. So when it comes to sitting a quarterback for a year, I always am for it. It's often not possible, but I'm always 100% for it. Not just because of Jordan Love or because of Patrick Mahomes being big successes from developing over a couple of years on the bench. It's really just because being a rookie in the NFL is so incredibly difficult. And if you're not truly ready for it, then you can get destroyed. It can ruin you right away. And some guys who started right away, they wouldn't have been successful if you sat them for 50 years. But is there a, a transition into the NFL that could have been a little easier for somebody to understand how it's supposed to work, understand how a playbook's supposed to work, develop some of the, the passing stuff uh, that maybe they could have used, you know, after a year. And we used to see in the NFL, a lot of quarterbacks would develop, they would get drafted in the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round, and they would develop and, and ultimately become starters. I was just watching a game with uh, Mark Brunel, or I've, I've brought up Matt Hasselback before, or, you know, Jake DeLome. Like there was an era where it felt like a lot of those quarterbacks kind of popped up. Tom Brady would be one of them. And I don't think it's a total coincidence that quarterbacks who had some time to develop had a better chance. That said, I would also point to CJ Stroud, Dak Prescott, Ben Roethlisberger. Like there's been a lot of quarterbacks through the years that have had success right away. It really depends on the person. Jordan Love 
was an interception machine in college. He still occasionally, as you saw in the playoffs, will let it rip into uh, more traffic than he should have a little too much belief in his arm, but he was not ready to play when they brought him in. If they brought him in and he threw 20 interceptions, that might've been really bad for him. And, you know, look, who knows on somebody like Marcus Mariota, if he would have had more time to develop or whatever number other starters that didn't work out. There's probably a couple though, at least, I mean, Justin Fields, maybe one of them who played for a tanking team and his confidence had to be at zero when he started in the NFL. It took him years to start looking like he understood what he was doing. Geno Smith is another one was not ready to come in and play right away. And then years later, he's an above average NFL quarterback. So I'm a big believer in that, but here's the problem. If you draft Michael Penix and he's going to be 24, I'd be fine with still developing him. I think the quarterbacks can play till they're 35. So that's okay. But is the ownership going to be okay with it? Is the GM going to be okay with it? Are the fans going to be okay with it? Do you really get that much time in the NFL? You might be developing your quarterback for somebody else if you have a really miserable year. I mean, I just think that that's kind of how it goes. So it all depends on the guy and it all depends on the situation. Could the Vikings pick JJ McCarthy and play Baker Mayfield for a year and then turn it over to McCarthy? Yeah. I mean, that seems like a good situation to me or Gardner Minshew or, you know, some, someone else that seems like a really good long-term solution to me. The NFL has just lost its mind when it comes to anything long-term though. Heck Dante Culpepper didn't play at all in that first year came out blazing as a sophomore. So yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I like it when teams do it and not everybody needs it. Anthony Richardson weirdly didn't need it. Everyone thought he did. And then he didn't when he showed up in the NFL. Um, so everybody's different. Everybody's needs are different, but you have to be willing to identify that and not force somebody into a situation they're not ready for. Last question from Andrew. What 2000s Madden game is your favorite? to go back to in the off season. Personally, I'm a Madden 07 guy. For me, it's very easy. It is Madden 05. I think that is where the Madden series peaked. Uh, you can certainly make a case for Madden 04. Very similar games. Uh, Madden 05 had the quarterback vision, which I turn off and do not use because it was just way too wonky to try to figure out. But uh, that game had just it had like the sports talk radio in the background with Tony Bruno and it had a great training camp. All those things that you would do. The off season was as realistic as it got with negotiating with players. I thought they started to do a better job with the draft pre scouting. You could go in and pre scout your draft picks and you get some of their ratings before you decided to pick them. Very intricate game. I just don't understand how Madden 05, which is now almost 20 years ago, can be a better game significantly than the present version of Madden. And look, if you love Madden currently, that's great. It's still a great game. It's still super fun. It's football. It still operates fairly well. But the recent Maddens that I've played, the other stuff is kind of missing. Uh, specifically, the training camp, leading in, developing your players, Developing them with XP points doesn't mean anything to me. It was really fun to go out there and kick field goals and make your field goal kicker better and uh, things like that. And look, uh, you know, I, I don't know if that was one of the years where you could transfer in your draft class, but I think it was. So you could play the college game and then transfer in your draft class. I mean, wow, that's a lot of good features. So yeah, I've I've actually got uh, quite a few games this off season that I'm going to be messing around with, but that will not take away from the coverage here at Purple Insider. And uh, look, if you want uh, your questions on a fans-only episode, it is very easy to do. Go to purpleinsider.com. Also, if you get a chance, if you're listening on the podcast side, uh, leave a, a review there if you like the show. That always helps it bump up algorithm-wise. And if you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe, all those things, they all help the channel. So I appreciate you all so much and we will see you soon. Thanks everybody.